Welcome to another episode of Pizza Punk. We are in a slightly different venue than we normally are because, you know, just like just like with filmmaking, there's this thing, it's called Murphy's Law. And what Murphy's Law is, it's it's the law of chaos. Anything that that could happen will happen and you have to be prepared and ready to think on your toes and nimbly conform to the situation. So that is what we've done. We're actually in a in a Zoom call uh, which is new for me in terms of doing the pizza punk show, but it's pizza punk none, nonetheless. I'm Jeff, and you know, I forgot to ask you, Bill. Should I call you Bill or should I call you yeah. William? Call me Bill. In print, I'm William, but in person, it's Bill. Okay, very cool. Thank you, Bill. I am. I have to tell you. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, this is my introduction. I'm gonna blow a little smoke up Bill's ass. He deserves it. Um, I have to do this. This is. This is. This is selfish right now, what I'm doing. This is an indulgence, pure indulgence right now. I am, this is an ambrosia for me to enjoy. So I've I've talked about Return of the Living Dead count for countless hours on my podcast, on my shows, on my on my YouTube channel. It's all I ever do. Um, I was like finally like, I need to get the production designer on the show if I can. I have to talk to this guy. Um Bill, Return of the Living Dead is probably the single most watched film I've ever seen in 35 years. I have wow. seen, yeah, I, I want to say that I've seen it over a hundred times. Um, it's the one of the few films that I can watch over and over. I never get sick of watching it. Um, I Sometimes I will watch it and then I'll watch it with a commentary right afterwards, back to back. Um, and, you know, there's so many commentaries out there that you really can never run out of content. So I've listened to a lot of the commentaries. I have the book. Um, I love the sequels. I'm sure that's very. <laughs> I'm sure that's a whole other another bag. I love the world. I love the universe that you helped to create. And so for me, and most of all, I'm sitting and I'm I on my the guest on my show is the creator of my childhood boogeyman. And this is what this is the story I want to introduce to the show. Talking to Bill, Bill, when I was ten years old. I was watching the sci-fi channel and it was back then it was spelled with the S and the Y. It was sci-fi. It wasn't, they didn't, they didn't spell it the right way. And on comes Return of the Living Dead. This must have been 1995. On comes Return of the Living Dead. I pop in a tape and I, for whatever reason, I start recording and watching this movie. I have no idea what it is. I fin it finishes playing out. I see the second half. I never saw the first half. I must have worn out that tape. <laughs> I wore that tape to the bone. And then once it was worn to the bone, I went to the, the, my local video store and I rented the movie, the hard R version. And I finally got to see the film in its entirety. I got to see the full Tar Man and was forever horrified by this creature that kind of came from your head. I mean, it was, you were influenced by things, but it, came from your from your head um what my my childhood bo boogeyman that that would terrify me and fascinate me all at the same time i think this is a phenomenon known as kinder trauma but it's like a positive thing it's a thing that it it, it ushers forth curiosity in a through fear but a, a playful fear and here's what i really want to tell you bill i think you will appreciate this so in you can't see it, but in my basement of horrors here, I have the Shout Factory edition. So I got the posters with the Tar Man front and center. And down the stairs comes my five-year-old son who knows nothing about this stuff. And the very first thing he says to me, he goes, Daddy, what is that? And I go, that's the Tar Man. And he is in, he's never seen the movie. I won't let him watch it until he's 10 years old. Because that's oh, the age when I saw it. So I'm, he's going to wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to show him this film. But he is absolutely horrified, fascinated, and curious, just like I was when I was a young lad. And it's just amazing how this, this thing from my childhood has been, this positive thing from my childhood has been passed along to my son. And it's a thing in our household. My son asked me, thousands of questions about the tar man what is the tar man made out of what does the tar man eat why is the tar man goopy what you know is he friendly 
Is he nice? Does he live? He thinks he lives in our boiler. We have a giant boiler tank because he saw the, 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 the barrel that he lives. So he thinks he lives in the boiler tank in our basement. He's super, he can't go down to the basement without one of us, but he always wants to go down to the basement and he always wants to look at the poster of Return of the Living Dead. And I, it's just this thing in our household and it's a thing that you created. And so I just wanted you to know that something that came from your mind has had such an impact on my family in a, in a wonderful, positive way. And I just want to say thank you. <laughs> hey, yeah. You are supremely welcome. I have the same relationship with King Kong. Really? I've seen it over a hundred times. In fact, oh. I, the first time it, it, it was the very first movie I ever saw. I was three years old and my parents took me to see it at the Reseda Drive-In. They did a, a re-release in 1952. And I think it did damage at a genetic level because I've been nuts about that movie and dinosaurs ever since. And I, I made the deal with my son. Uh, I've got two grandsons. I said, I have to be the first person to show them King Kong and it has to be on the big screen, not on TV. And so I, I was able to show my oldest grandson, but then, you know, COVID came like, God, I, I was a week away from showing it to my youngest grandson and COVID came and that meant no more going to the movies. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting for it all to clear so I can take him to see it on the big screen. Um, I have to ask you a question. I'm very curious because it's a, I'm always asked like to ask the diehard 1930, is it 1933 or 1935? 33. 33. 1933 King Kong fans. I'm always curious to know, how do you feel about Peter Jackson's version of King Kong? Not a fan. Not a fan. It, a complete opposite adverse reaction. I, uh, you know, when I first, when I saw the first trailer, I was so excited and, and, uh, until they showed Kong and then I was like, oh, well, that's not Kong. That's just a big gorilla. Because Kong's got a face as distinctive as Clark Gable, mm, uh -oh. that and made it you know much more realistic and detailed and stuff, but but they didn't. Nevertheless, I was there for the very first screening at midnight of Jackson's King Kong, and when it opened, I was so excited because I love that opening, that, that Depression era New York City, mm. with the counterpoint of a jaunty light and playful song on the soundtrack i thought oh this is going to be great this is going to be deep and it's going to be rich and fulfilling and then it didn't do any of that stuff <laughs> i was just i'm very disappointed i'm so sorry to hear that that was your experience but um the uh, let me ask you this though what did you think of the the bug scene that uh that that jackson inserted what did that compare how did that compare to your first of all you when you re saw it re-released in theaters did you see it with the original was like a spider scene in there oh, right the pit sequence yeah yeah you know i put out two books uh tribute to willis o'brien volume one tribute to willis o'brien volume two willis o'brien huh. was the animator of king kong huh and i did a lot of deep digging into the spider pit sequence and I don't believe it exists. I don't believe it ever existed. Because Marion C. Cooper, the director of the film, he had three stories. Yes, it existed. It was in the film, but I cut it out because it, it's just stopped the film dead. Then in another interview, he said, yeah, we, we did it, but I, it never made it to the film. And then in another interview, he said, yeah, uh, it was never, it was in the, originally in the script, but it was never filmed. So he had three completely different stories as to what happened. My friend Ray Bradbury said he saw the spider, pits, uh, spider pit sequence in King Kong in 1933 when the film came out. I think it's a false memory. Wow. And, you know, it's just, I find false memories fascinating uh, because I had one with Son of Kong. Really? And in, in uh, when I was doing the tribute to... Uh, Willis O'Brien, I was doing drawings of every animated creature that O'Brien yeah. had ever done. So when I got to Son of Kong, I, I especially wanted to draw the scene uh, with the death of the little Kong, where he's holding Carl Denham in his hand, and he's sinking below the waves, and they rescue Carl Denham, and then he watches the hand slowly goes under the surface of the ocean. 
So I watched that again because I wanted to make sure I had the bandage on the right finger and mm -hmm. stuff. That scene's not in the movie. I've talked to so many people who vividly remember that scene. It was never shot. It was never in the film. What happens is Carl Denham is in Little Kong's hand. They rescue right. Carl Denham. And then the camera follows the boat with Carl Denham. You never see the hand sink below the ocean. But it, I think it's a credit to the filmmakers that they were able to conjure up something magical that made you think you had seen Little Kong drown and die. But it's not there. You know, it's interesting you say it. First of all, I find this fascinating. First of all, how does it feel to feel so, you you to hear about how King Kong and the King whatever and Son of Kong and yada 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 in, impact and inform and influence your life, and then to think that you have done the exact same thing with your creations. You know, I know that obviously it was brought to life by other people in terms of makeup and it's a, filmmaking is a collaborative team team effort, but you were the one that came up with this idea. You're the one that drew that and came up with this idea that, that, um, that uh, O'Bannon had written. Cause he's not written really as he's kind of written that like that a little bit, but you were the one who took the, this idea of, of this, of this tar man. So my question to you is, do, have you felt that in your life, like this this idea that so many people are affected by the Tar Man in the same way that you are affected by King Kong? Absolutely, and it always takes me by surprise because when you're making a film, I don't care what film it is, who the director is, who the writer is, you never know if that film is going to be successful or not because right. the missing ingredient always is the audience. It's the audience who determines what lives on and what doesn't, and so it's. You know, when I, I've made, oh gosh, I've worked on over 60 films and you can never tell what's going to connect with the audience. Um, yeah, I was actually, I, well, I wanted to, here's the thing. I'm like super divided because I really want to talk about Return of the Living Dead, but I was very shocked to see that you worked on The Mist. You worked on First Blood. You've worked on a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah. But let, all right, let's, we'll, we'll get there. But first let's, uh, let, let me, uh. All right, let me finish about uh, Return of the Living Dead because this is I, I want to uh, I really want to tackle this. Now, here's the thing, and this is what some people may not realize: you have the writer, you have the director, you have the cinematographer. It takes a team to bring uh, a movie to life, as I just said. But the thing that never is criminally, I would say, criminally, that people do not talk about this thing in the way that they talk about cinematographers, in the way that they talk about directors, in the way that they talk about screenwriters. There's not enough talk about production designers. At oh, least I totally a, agree. Totally agree. Yeah, it's it's a real shame because you have to think about this. Break down that word, production designer. The designer of the production. Hello, like this super important element. And so even though Dan wrote the script and wrote the characters and stuff, you took it from the written word and you fleshed it into reality with vis with all sorts of visual information. Cause this is what, this is the interesting thing about another thing that production designers and art directors and, you know, concept drawers do what they do is they, they sort of, you guys are subtly writing story and information visually into the film that is not informed by the written word. And it's, it's very accurate observation. Yeah. For, for the folks out there who don't know what a production designer is, he's responsible for everything you see on the screen except for the performances of the actors. Yeah. Yeah. So when I think of, and that's why I'm so sort of like, you know, fanboy nerding out right now. Yes, Return of Living Dead is Dan O'Bannon's, but it is also yours. And so it's so cool to talk to the dude. <laughs> <laughs> to talk to the dude, you know what I mean? Um, so the, and, when I became a production designer, I investigated the history of production design. And the very first huh. time that term was used was for a big hero of mine, a, a gentleman named William Cameron Menzies. He had completely designed Gone with the Wind. Huh. He storyboarded the entire film in full color. Wow. And he directed a third of the movie, including the Burning of Atlanta sequence. But the other director... Victor Fleming did not want to share credit and he was adamant about not sharing credit and taking sole credit for the direction of the film. So 
David Selznick, the producer, was faced with this dilemma. He came up with this idea and he approached Menzies. He says, the film will say production designed by William Cameron Menzies. And that was the first time the term production designer was used. That's Prior so to that, they were called art directors. Production designer, actually, as production designer, the art director works for me. The art director right. in, uh, in his capacity on a film with me is he's responsible for a lot of the budgeting and the planning. Okay. And that frees me up to just draw and paint and create the look of the film. I was going to add, if I may contribute, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, he's also kind of like the executor on a production level, right? During production, if you're sort of, even if you're there overseeing things, like that's the guy who's sort of carrying out what you're designing. Yeah, when I'm production right? design, I'm on set every day. Right. I'm a real hands-on right. production designer. Which is why I am, you are going, I'm hoping that you can answer some questions so here's the thing and again we sort of have talked about this a little bit already the uh, about the idea of how the there is so much there's so much extra writing story writing whatever you want to call it so much writing gets done visually when a production designer creates because you could have a thing you know if a, if a screenwriter or if a writer director writes the washing machine but that's it that's just a word washing machine and then the production designer puts stickers on the side of the washing machine and puts a dent in the washing machine. And suddenly you get the viewer who never would have been informed by this by, from the director to the writer is suddenly going, they've had this washing machine for a very long time and it's seen a lot of mileage. And even though that's like a small little detail, it's a detail nonetheless. And that doesn't come from the writer director that comes from the production designer. I think a great example of that is in Return of the Living Dead is the crematorium in the way that you were influenced by real life horrors. Dan O'Bannon and I uh, did research. We went to several crematoriums in the Los Angeles area and several uh, funeral parlors. And, <clears throat> and they were actually uh, amazingly free and open to showing us what they did and how it was done. I remember we went to one place huh. and the guy said, oh, you've never seen a dead body. And he popped open the lid. There was this old lady lying there in his office. And he said, oh, you never seen bodies burning? Come on, I'll show you. We're burning some right now. And uh, he took me, <laughs> he took us to, to the uh, oven and opened up the door and, and showed us the bodies burning inside there. And I said, oh, well, you've got like three bodies in here. I thought you're supposed to burn them one at a time. He says, eh. Nobody knows. We just burn the three, divide up the ashes into three chunks. Who cares? Not to get morbid, but my not to get not to bring it down a note or be macabre. But literally, <laughs> I was just talking about this with my mother because my my grandmother, who just passed away, was cremated. And wow. my first thought to my mom, I said, "If you're cremating her, you better make sure that it's her," because I have heard all sorts of stories about this about that this practice happens you have to be incredibly and you know at the end of the day do you really know i mean at the end of the day what is a body but a body but like you know you know still it's just kind of it's kind of crazy to think that you have to think that that stuff happens all over the united states you know what i mean like yeah we were left alone at one point in this one crematorium and we saw all these little tiny brown paper bags and O'Bannon said hmm i wonder what this is and they all had names on them uh baby Susan, baby Jimmy, baby, and, and they were cremated babies. Oh, so Dan my God. Took, took one of the bags and he spilled it out on the counter. She, we should see what this looks like. And he goes, hmm, looks like vermiculite. And I, and I said, Dan, <laughs> that's, that's someone's kid. Yeah. And then we heard somebody coming and he quickly swept it back into the back <laughs> and took the bag back. <laughs> that consistently happened. And this was the creepiest thing of all. After we'd visit each of these places, we'd be walking back to Dan's car and an employee we, an employee would come running up to us and say, I just gotta tell you, they're fucking the bodies. They're having sex with the corpses. This was consistent at every single place. Uh, this, this stuff is insane though. Like it really is <laughs> insane. Um, and you know, it's interesting. It kind of like you're doing that, going out to these places and doing this kind of research really you feel even though it's a film about people dead people coming back to life and eating brains 
it very much has these those kind of real world touches in in the processes that are seen and explained mm-hmm. in the film and uh it just sort of it just sort of blows my mind let me ask you let me let me get this out of the way let me ask you this sure. these questions I want to talk about, so first of all, answer me this. I, I love that you said what you said about the spider scene in King Kong, the spider fight, because this is what I want to know. So Scream Factory releases what essentially might be the definitive release that we're ever going to get of Return of the Living Dead. I'm pretty satisfied as a fan. However, we were originally promised 20 or 25 extra minutes of deleted scenes. That was what they said was going to be in the um in in the in the release and it never came and instead we were blessed with a very uh a much higher quality than what's on youtube copy of the work print which has 20 minutes of extra alternative takes and stuff but my question to you is this how much was shot that we did not see of return of living dead not too much really really not too much. I mean, uh, the work print, which I, I've got a copy of on on videotape, that's it's pretty much all we shot. Uh, hmm. If there's anything extra in that, that's okay. so so okay. So what you're saying is pretty much there wasn't too much extra stuff that was shot that no. that made it to the cutting room floor. Interesting. It was a low budget film with a very tight script. Right. Right. Um, there, you know, I did notice, so I got my hands on a 1983 copy of the script and I, I did notice one thing that was, that was cut out that never made it anywhere. There's this like little insert of like, uh, the guy, the, you know, they're driving to, to Unita and they almost run over a chicken. There's this whole bit with chickens. I don't know if you remember that from the script. Yeah, you know, that's a funny thing. Uh, I recently, about a month ago, Frank Dietz organized a table read of Return of the Living Dead and I read uh, uh, Jimmy Karen's part. Yeah. And so he sent us all the script. I said, well, I, you know, I've got the shooting script. So I, I just started working from that. And I looked right. at it and I compared the first couple of pages of the shooting script with the script that Frank sent me and they were the same. So I just assumed that it was all the same. And then we're in the middle of, of doing the table read, a live table read, and they're reading scenes I'd never heard of. <laughs> Yeah, dude. So it must be the same the same copy that you had because I there were all kinds of scenes I, we never shot, weren't in the film, but I and I wasn't aware of because uh it was just not in the final shooting script that I was working with. That is so bizarre to me. Yeah, By the way, the, that chicken thing you're talking about. Yeah, that that was like that that's what I mean. That's what that's what blew my mind because yeah, I we, saw we never, Yeah, we never shot that. Right, right, right. It was still, you know, I got to tell you, that was still pretty cool to see that chicken thing, though. Yeah. And hold on. well, it's fun to see the process to see what made it to the final screen and what got dropped out. Right. So this is the book. And I wanted to go, I wanted to ask you very specifically. And again, I if you can't answer, if you can't answer this, I, I totally understand. And again, I know this stuff is all like a while ago and yada, 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 but I've, oh, these, these things have always cu- uh, made me curious. And if anybody is going to be able to answer them, it is you. Uh, so for those who don't know, who are not familiar, there were two special effects makeup artists that were on Return of the Living Dead. There was William Munns and Mr. Munns uh, was, was uh, fired halfway through and he was replaced by Kenny Myers, who picked up the the slack, and um, the the I always see these stills. I don't know if you could you could see this the picture. These are yeah. some of William Munns's masked uh, zombies. What was this? Was this from unseen an unseen like insert footage or something? Where does this Where does this picture come from? I have always yeah. I, I I really have no idea. We did have another makeup artist working on the film. Rick Baker was a really close friend of mine back then. And I called him up. I said, have you got anybody who's really good that you can loan to us? And he loaned me a, a young kid named Tony Gardner. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah, I was going to say, I sh- I'm, you know what? Uh, shame on me for not mentioning Tony Gardner and his split dogs and his half corpse. And yes, he that was his first 
that was his first uh show really yeah, right? he came through like a champ it was funny he he got the when i tried to bring him in he, he later told me when he had the private meeting with the producer graham henderson uh graham said the classic words you fuck this up tony you'll never work in this town again <laughs> It just scared the hell out of this, out of Tony. I, I mean, Tony was just a, I believe a teenager at the time. And he's like, oh no. <laughs> but he came, he came to the set with the half carbs and was showing how that operated. And Graham took him aside and said, Tony, how would you like your credit? Yeah, it's trial. That was trial by fire. And I, re you know, I was at the Sleepy Hollow International Film Festival and there was Tony Gardner who just, you know, mm -hmm. was just walking around and I just bum rushed him. And I was like, dude, <laughs> he was so shocked. He was so shocked that anybody knew who he was. Yeah. And I just, you know, I gave him all the accolades that I gave you, you know, just being like, dude, that, that movie meant so much to me. Took a picture with him. Uh, an incredible fellow who has done some unbelievable work in this industry, including the blob, the stuff that he yeah. did on the blob. Woo! Um, uh, Bill, can you see this photo that's, here it's it's uh scuzz and spider and casey and they're staring into a crypt and this was another photo that made my jaw drop because i was like this isn't in the film what could this be and so it looks like a scene from it looks like a still from a, a never seen scene it looks like it but it could just be an off-the-cuff photograph of the actors examining parts of my set oh man well i guess that that answers okay that could be the that's probably the occam's razor of the situation fair enough um and what a set it was uh the the set that you built that was one of the things that that has always taken my breath away and sort of bl blown my hair back the the way that you in a very EC comic book like way let's go to the drawings we'll just go to the drawings because they're here yeah it, ecs were a big influence on me still yeah. are you can tell and you want to know something one of my favorite games is you, you know the tales from the crypt series uh the tales from the crypt series i always like to think like what movies were secretly tales from the crypt films without actually being under the brand tales from the crypt and you know i always think of death becomes her as one of those films yeah. it's very tales from the crypty um just stuff like that and i'd say that return of the living dead would be at the top for a not tales from the crypt tales from the crypt film because it has every it has so much and it really is it's in the it's in the production design you could see that in all of um uh bill's drawings and here's here's the drawing with with all the choked up graves man and it just is terrifying to me <laughs> and just above it is the attic set and i got one of the nicest compliments of my career uh don kalpa came up to me during the filming and he said, you know, I, I, I just saw that that attic set and I, I was afraid to go in it because, oh my God, you know, there's all that dust and cobwebs. And then I realized, wait a minute, that's not real cobwebs. That's not real dust. <laughs> this yeah. is a set. But he said, you would totally convince me that it was real. Now, I, I've always looked for them and I can never find them. Where are, where is the jar of teeth? Where, where am I not fine? I, I was told that there is a jar of teeth somewhere inserted in the set, which plays into another character. So here's the thing. Again, one of the, the, the greatest um, character back, some of the greatest character backstory writing that takes place in Return of the Living Dead comes from Ernie in the sense that Ernie is a Nazi in hiding and it's never, ever once said and maybe there's a couple of words that might infer that in the script i don't remember but yeah, he speaks a little german at, at one point right and he says when the when the when it's raining cats and dogs but besides that every single thing that in that implies this is told through the production design yes what how did this you know, a lot of that a lot of that came from don kalfa himself he would bring things to the set can you use this huh. he found that old german calendar yeah, I said, yeah, well, yeah, we can use that. That's great. Yeah. And I have literally, I mean, when I watch this movie and I've seen it so many times and I was so happy when it came in on Blu-ray, you know, I literally I'm, st I'm sitting there and I'm just freeze framing and just looking at all the stuff that you guys 
put on the walls and put in the, you know, Bird is a slave driver, you know, just all this, you know, all this, all this jazz. And it's just, it's just incredible. Let's talk about the basement for a second, because the basement has captured my mind. Oh, here's something else that's interesting. So you did, before we get there, sorry, I'm like ADD overload. Um, so here is the full sequence of trash coming back to life. Um, there were several sequences in the movie and it seems like, okay, so another thing that some people don't realize, I'm sure Bill is very familiar with this, is that a movie is written so many times uh, during the, the production. It's written on the page. It's written again during production where various things that don't translate have to be fixed or you know, production design comes in and those visual elements help rewrite the script. It gets written again in editing. Editing is another form of rewriting where scenes are cut or things are, are retconned. And one of the things that always felt like it was really written in the edit are some of Trash's scenes as a zombie. One being when she comes out of the mud, because look at all these extra storyboards. This leads me to believe that there that she was supposed to do more stuff in like this this frame here, where she's suddenly realizing that she is dead and that she's come back to life and she she shrieks. Um, what did, where did this come from and why was it never used? Uh, that was in the script. Huh. And, uh, you know, the basic outline of the scene, obviously it wasn't in the detail that I put into my pictures. But, uh, yeah, I don't know why it was cut. I, I thought it was, oh, I'm really big on entrances. I, I think important characters in the film should have really memorable entrances. And to me, that was an entrance because she's changing from a girl to the zombie. So she's really making an entrance as, it's her entrance as a zombie. What's interesting about your, your illustrations here and what you managed to do in two dimensions, just with your, your paper and your pen, is you give this character who's supposed to be, you know, in the 80s, every character was just fodder to be killed, mostly, you know, in, in some of these horror films. You <laughs> give this character more dimension. You give her pathos. She has real pathos in, in these frames. And I, it's a shame that it was never used, but it always sort of, whenever I looked at these frames in this book, I'm just always like, wow. Like, what was that about? I guess there was supposed to be more, and it just always kind of blew my mind. Yeah, the seed of that pathos is when she is talking about, you know, her worst fear, which is being eaten alive by zombies. Right, <laughs> which is so funny. So it's foreshadowing what's about to happen. And then she gets just what she wants. And something I want to talk to you about, maybe you'll appreciate this the way I do, some people don't realize this when when trash is talking doing her whole little thing about being ripped alive you know being ripped up to have my clothes ripped off and eaten alive um there are mushrooms right out of focus right by their feet because they're shooting kind of up and you can see mushrooms and it's such a great touch it really made me feel the cemetery so much more and what's amazing is the cemetery in this film is not actually a cemetery at all. It doesn't exist. It was created and it feels so real. The, the Spanish peat moss, the mushrooms. And so I wanted to ask you about the mushrooms because I, in my mind, the only person who was like, put, I don't think, I don't know if Dan was like, hey, we need some mushrooms in the foreground. I would imagine that you were like, put some, put those mushrooms in the foreground. Do, do you remember yeah. anything about the mushrooms? <laughs> well, obviously they were fake. Right, right. <laughs> you know. I, I might have had Tony make those for me. He, he did a lot of little little things in addition to the half corpse. All that stuff is really important to me in, in, in setting the scene. One of the, th one of the things I do is, is something that the audience never sees. When I was the production designer in Masters of the Universe, uh, there's a, the Courtney Cox character, has a, there's a scene in her bedroom. And prior to shooting, I went to her dresser and I filled her dresser drawers with everything that character would have. Huh. And then, closed, then closed the drawers. And then I st stood back and, and just watched. And Courtney came on set and she was looking all around because it, it was all kinds of visual elements to tell her who her character was and what her character was interested in, what her life was like. And then she walked over to the dresser and she just sort of 
absentmindedly pulled open one of the drawers and I saw her light right up. Oh my God, this is all her stuff. And it really helped to inform the actor as a character uh, by having all that stuff really there, even though it was never seen on screen. That's, and that's the most beautiful, that's the, I think that is the most beautiful part of the collaboration between a production designer. And just think in your mind how, I don't know, and some might say that it could be almost subversive in some situations, while other situations it's not. But it's just amazing how much the production designer can inform and add without, you know, I mean, because let me ask you a question. How much of that was when you were doing that? Did you talk with the director about what you were putting in the drawer or was the director just kind of like, um, I'm, I'm doing some other stuff? No, when I'm production designer, I, I take all the key characters and I write, I do what actors do. I write histories of the person, where they came from, what their life was like, how, where they were born, uh, what the relationship was with their parents and their friends, what they were interested in in, in regards to school and hobbies and stuff. And so it, it creates a fuller picture of the character and, and it gives me uh, fuel as to what to put on the sets to represent what I'm sort of thinking their history implies. Um, that's amazing. And I'm so glad to hear that. And that leads me to my next question. So I've never done this with any movie that I've ever, maybe off the cuff, but I've never actually had to do this in my life, except with this one character. I had to know who was the tar man before he was the tar man. And so I actually, on my own volition, I, I thought up, and this is, I guess, this is a real testament to your, to what you guys did, because the best, the, some of the best writing or some of the best storytelling doesn't give you the full picture and captures your imagination and makes you use your brain to sort of fill in the gaps or to try and explain why and how and who. And so something that has, since I was 10 years old, I've wondered these things is I'm 35 is who is the tar man? Who are the other people that were in those barrels? Um, you know, like just all this stuff. Like I thought maybe the tar man's a soldier or he worked at the VA hospital or he got mixed up in this situation. Um, and stuffed in a barrel with everybody else. I thought maybe in my mind, the tar man was actually in love with another one of the the zombies in one of those barrels and that they had a whole love story before they got shoved in those barrels and put in the bed. Like, oh, my brain went to all these different places. But now that I'm talking to the guy who drew this guy, by the way, is this the, uh, what is this one of the first tar man um, drawings that you did? Did you have earlier ones than this? I don't know if you can it's, see that. Um, the one... Yeah, that, that's the very first Tar Man drawing right there, the head. Wow. So Dan O'Bannon came to me and he said, look, Bill, all films have principal characters. Ours is going to be the first film to have principal zombies. I want you to design zombies that are unique that people have never seen before. He says, I don't want them, any of them to look like the George Romero zombies in Night of the Living Dead. And so the first one I tackled was the Tar Man. And I did that drawing and Dan just lit up. He said, that's it. That's that's great. Okay, this is and it gave him confidence that he'd pick the right guy to design the film, and that uh, he was going to get exactly what he wanted in terms of zombies. Wow! And you know what's amazing? And again, you know they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and right here in this photograph, every single thing that you like imagine about the tar man like is is represented right here the grin the eyes again talking about almost even pathos in my mind the tar man i know that he just goes brains but in my mind the tar man is actually a tragic character he's not i think that, and again i know you could say no jeff you're wrong I, <laughs> I i i was the one who i thought it up like i think i would know but in my mind, the Tar Man is actually this tragic character who is actually afraid of people and hides in the basement and only acts that way when he's hungry. And then the moment that he's eaten, 
he suddenly feels really bad about what he did. <laughs> and, and I get that feeling when I look at this picture, like this guy who's so he's not evil. He's just hungry and he just needs to eat brains. <laughs> I get that from the half corpse as well. Yes. Yes. Because yes. She talks about what it's like to be dead and revivified and how painful it is and that the brains take away the pain. And I, and I turned to Dan, I said, this is brilliant. Uh, it's the eating the brains takes away the pain because they're, they're basically feeding on the endorphins that the brain produces, uh, which is a, 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 the body's own natural painkiller. And Dan said, wow, that's great. He said, I didn't think of that, but I'll take credit for it. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It really is brilliant because here's the thing. And you may have a different opinion on this, but in my, as a fan of, and I'm as much as I love Return of the Living Dead, I also love Night of the Living Dead too. Mm -hmm. And I think what doesn't get said enough, and people don't think about this, but Return of the Living Dead is just as much of a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, in my opinion, mm -hmm. as Dawn of the Dead is, in the sense that it's this super meta, like, take on how you would continue the story of night of the living dead oh night of the living dead is actually a movie based on a real event and it involves this it's like this incredible reset where you can suddenly change all the rules so you're not because i think that's that was something really admirable that what dan did in terms of he didn't want to just copy romero he wanted to do his own thing right and he used the same creativity that he did with Alien to do, uh, do Return of the Living Dead. Um, exactly. And that's why I didn't do the sequel to Return of the Living Dead, because I read the script and I said, hey, this guy plagiarized two thirds of Dan's script. The thing that made Return of the Living Dead work was not the title, which is what the producer thought. It was the originality. Yep. Yep. Uh, question. So, so since we're talking about that, let me ask you this. How... Uh, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. How do you feel about the third movie? Do you feel the same way about the second one? I haven't seen any of the sequels. Oh, you haven't seen? Oh, you just, yeah, okay. I was offered to be production designer on the first sequel and turned it down because I, I just felt so insulted that the writer had plagiarized so much. You know, it's funny. I hear all sorts of rumblings about, you know, oh, there might be a new Return of the Living Dead in the future, yada, yada, yada. And I feel like if anybody could do it justice, if they were, because it really is, if you, you can't remake this movie, there are, there are movies out there, you know, I'm of, the, I'm of the belief that you should never remake good movies. You should right. remake movies that have good ideas, but are not executed well. I'm totally and, on board with that. That is absolutely my philosophy. Yeah, and it's just like why remake? And there there are a few rare examples where you can where they do a remake and it kind of works really well. But for the most part, I'm watching all these films and I'm, I'm watching. I was just watching The Beast Must Die, which is a vampire werewolf mystery from 1974. And I'm going, great idea, terrible execution. Don't remake, you know, this film X amount of times. Remake this film, give it to Blumhouse, let them do it. Yeah, um, actually, my first film as production designer was uh, going to be uh, Godzilla. Really? Yeah. Uh, Fred Decker wrote this incredible screenplay, and Steve Miner was producing. He was also going to direct. He initially hired me to be the storyboard artist, and then uh, actually mentor Hubner, one of the great storyboard artists of all time. He storyboarded. Uh, a lot of Hitchcock films, he was visiting my studio and he was looking at my boards. He said, Bill, these boards are so detailed. You're designing the film. You should ask to be the production designer. It hadn't occurred to me, but I called Steve Miner up and asked him and he did his homework, checked around, asked around the industry. And he called me back and said, okay, you're the production designer. Wow. So I was on that film for two years. I had put together a dream art department. Rick Baker was building me a gigantic uh, robotic Godzilla head. Uh, we were going to do the Godzilla creature with stop motion animation. Yeah. And uh, David Allen was going to be the animator. Uh, Steven Cherkis built uh, the maquette puppet with the you know internal right. machinery and stuff. Uh, Dave Stevens 
the creator of The Rocketeer, and Doug Wildey, the creator of Johnny Quest, were storyboarding the film for me, as, as I was as well. And it was just the right project at the wrong time. But what I loved about it was we, we ran, at, my God, is that a slow film? It is just painfully slow. Are you? But I thought, well, this is great because the public is going to think they're going to see some crappy Japanese Godzilla film, and we're going to hit them with a Steven Spielberg-like Godzilla film and totally blow their socks off. But it was the right project at the wrong time. It was obviously going to be an expensive film, and at that time, four big budget films failed at the box office, Heaven's Gate being one of them. And That's so the studios were all big budget, no way. That's a shame. That's a shame. Let me ask you this. Um, would you, do you think if, if they did bring back Return of the Living Dead in some way, shape, or form, and they asked you to be there from the ground up, is that something that you would entertain? Or at this point, you're just like, um, I'm, I'm over it. I'm done. Oh, if the script is great, sure. That it, it all depends upon the script. And I've never worked on a film where more sequels have been written by the crew. <laughs> yes. Oh, my everybody, God. Everybody wrote sequels to Dan's picture. What is that about? Yeah. Wait, you wrote a script too? Yeah. It was, uh, it was a sequel. It wasn't a remake. It was a sequel. Would you, Okay. Tell, tell me. And, Just and, a, and give I us a smidgen. And I, I used it. Uh, it had punks in it, and yeah. the punks are in a van. They're on the way to a gig, and they collide with a, a truck that's got the, the fluid that turns people into zombies. And they sort of merge into a mass, where there's guitars sticking out of this mass, and heads and hands, and it's the whole band is the creature. And then I also had a uh, Auschwitz survivor. Uh, uh, come alive inside a, a sort of a curio museum shop. Oh my and God. I tried to do what Dan did, which was create zombies no people had ever seen before and, and made. So it, it was a fun exercise in writing. Obviously, um, But that's what's interesting. Don Kalfa, Brian Peck, you, it's just like, what is it about Return of the Living Dead that made every, everybody was so inspired to sort of like do their own version or want to continue the story or want to sort of uh, make it work, uh, which leads me back to my question about the tar man. Have in your mind, when you're writing, when you're, when you're drawing something like this, do you, do you, did you remember from what anything you can remember, who was the tar man before he was the tar man? Or is it just lost to time or a mystery? I, I would say lost in time and a, uh, mystery. The main thing I wanted to convey was that I wanted each zombie to have a personality. I didn't want them to just be a dead thing brought to life, but I wanted to show some of the humanity in in both a scary and a humorous way. Wow. Wow. Um, and this right here, this picture right here, if you turn your head to see the, um, the or you can see the picture below, uh, this was William Munn's design of your of your drawing uh was do you think in your opinion is this the one thing more than anything else that william munns sort of landed were you satisfied overall with the tar man i know there's a lot of things you were not satisfied with um yeah. i thought the tar man was the best thing that bill did for us yeah yeah i finally, finally starting to get it right right uh, yeah, I would agree, man. I think it's uh, amazing. It's criminal what you see. Like, this was supposed to be the original zombie, the party time zombie. Oh, that was my biggest disappointment in the film. Yeah. When he, when he showed me that, I thought he was just showing me the mechanics. I didn't realize he thought he was showing me finished art. I was just horrified. I mean, it's a bummer because you look at, when you look at that and the way that it rises up, it's like, again, the, the brilliance of your your illustration is you really are there, there's a lot of in, uh, emotion that's being informed in the actual drawing of these characters they all have they all have feelings man they all have like you know something going on in some way shape or form that that makes that work let me see what else we got here that I really wanted to discuss with you. You know, again, also, because you're... I only take 50% of the credit for Tarman. The other 50% I give to Alan Troutman, the guy in the suit. Oh my God, yes. It can't because be. Yeah. When, when I design creatures for films, I always insist do not put a stuntman in the suit. I want an actor. 
because the actors will bring that suit to life. And boy, Alan really brought the tar man to life. He, he can move as though his bones aren't connected. It's just yeah. incredible. Yeah. He, and by the way, people, this is some of Bill Munn's. Bill Munn thought that that was an acceptable yellow cadaver. I mean, just absolutely oh. insane. I mean, just so oh, crazy. God. That was just so embarrassing. Embarrassing is, is, is beyond, it's not, I wish there was a word that was beyond embarrassing. Um, but yes, Alan you can't, and you know, it's funny. I'm actually watching this show with my son right now on Disney channel. And I, and I looked in the credits and I was laughing. Uh, dinosaurs. If anybody remembers the dinosaur, you know, I'm the baby. Gotta love me. The, the mother is played by yeah, Alan. Alan is, uh, yeah. Alan's very talented puppeteer. Yeah. And he, uh, and boy, the puppets here, here we go. Here's Alan right there. There's a picture of him. And yes, he really does bring, he brings the character to life. Now, what's interesting is if you notice, and some people may notice, some people may not notice, there are, there seem to be, there is a slight continuity. I, I wouldn't, I don't know if you want to call it an error or it just seems a little out of place. There's a continuity. It's not on in, in the book. Um, but that like it cuts away to shots where the car tar man is covered in blood and then it cuts back to shots where he's not covered in blood it's like this really weird thing that i never noticed before upon a very recent watching that i noticed i was like wait a minute that's after he bites suicide's brains because before um he's he's more dry his his skull is weathered it's not covered in blood and it seems like something was um it seems like something was, uh, uh, I don't know, like, like again, written in the edit that allowed for that to happen. Um, I don't know. Super weird. But um, I never noticed that. <laughs> I, I have to go back and watch it again. If you, if you watch, I don't know when the last time you watched, but if you watch, you'll see it cuts to a shot where he's clearly, where the tar man, and you can even see that the tar man is saying brains, but he's not saying it, obviously. It's just going like that, and he's covered in blood, and then it cuts back to whatever is happening with uh, Beverly as Tina. Um, and it's like this weird sort of uh, shot that just seems, I just, I never noticed it before. And I didn't notice it until I got the Blu-ray. It had never ever uh, crossed my mind. And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes it's so weird how things come together in editing, which leads me to this, to uh, ask you this question. There's a still shot at the end, Bill. And by the way, thank you for indulging every whim in this. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> you really, you really made my day today. Yeah. Um, you're, you're testing my memory. <laughs> uh, yes, I know, I know. And I, again, you know, guys, remember this stuff happened 35 years ago, 36, 37 years ago, 38 years ago. Um, so we're, we are, we have to be, we have to be kind to Bill's, uh, Bill's memory. <laughs> um, there is the scene when the bomb is about to drop at the end. And right. you see a shot of all the zombies. It's like daybreak. You see right. it crashes at the center looking up. It's killed me. I have always wondered, what is that still frame from? Was that footage? Is that just a still that they inserted into the film? Because it seems like, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to, there's nothing else that connects to it. Do you remember anything about that? I, I don't remember it being a still photo. I remember having the group there and Dan directing them to look up. Hmm. But it's just like, when you look at it, it seems like it's just a static shot, which is why I always wondered, huh, I wonder if that was there was more to that scene. And then they were like, oh, it's not working. So let's just use this static shot. That I guess, you know, who else would, would might know would be John Penny, another guy who wrote a sequel from the Return, from Return of the Living Dead. He wrote the Return of the Living Dead 3, he was an assistant editor on Return of the Living Dead. So that's, that's interesting. Um, let me ask you about, so tell me about your work now. I'm curious to know, what was your work on The Mist? You were a conceptual artist or you were, what, what was exactly done on The Mist? Well, I'm, I'm a longtime friend of Frank Darabont, the director. Brilliant director. Really brilliant director. I directed one of my favorite films of all time, Shawshank Redemption. Brilliant movie. Yeah, but he's also a big horror fan and he loves doing horror horror films. So anyway, he uh, had signed on as the director for The Mist. And 
he called up all his friends, me, Bernie Wrightson, and, and other artists he admires. He said, okay, we finally get to do some stuff together. And I immediately uh, reread the story, the Stephen King story, and made notes on all the creatures that were described by Stephen King. And then uh, the, I, oh, I don't think the screenplay was finished yet. Frank was writing the screenplay. So I was working from the uh, Stephen King short story and just designing all the creatures that appeared in the short story. Um, and then the next day I got uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so there's no way I could continue on the film. But I had already done designed uh, three creatures and sent those off to Frank and my spider creature made it into the movie. Ah, that's your spider. Well, first of all, I'm very sorry to hear about that diagnosis. And I'm glad that you're here with us today talking. And that's all I will say about that. But I'm just very glad to hear that. Whatever. You know what I mean. Um, second of all, uh, that spider creature is one of my favorite creatures in the whole uh, in the whole movie. Great creature. Oh, cool. Oh, oh, thank you. So Thanks terrifying. So, so terrifying. Because... You know, once you see the spider creatures, in my opinion, the moment that they encounter the spider creatures is a moment where you, I really felt like, okay, they are fucked. Like they are not going to get out of this. Okay. The, like these things are, they're just so, they're so deadly and they're so uh, insidious. And the fact that they're small and that they crawl around. Let me ask you this. Um, how did you feel about the black and white version of the film oh i love the black white version because for me the mist is like a great twilight zone uh yeah but an hour and a half instead of just one hour and so to and that was originally frank wanted it released in black and white and i, I totally agreed with him um so the reason why i bring it up and i wanted to check with you first because here's a here's my honest truth honest truth when i went to go see the mist I was super, I was super duper excited. I, I was, I was like, I was stoked. This was a, a, a very much anticipated film. I didn't know, I was, I would, I didn't realize that you had done work on it. Um, much anticipated film for me. Uh, go into the movie. I'm riveted. I'm at the edge of my seat, riveted at this film. And then I see that tentacle. And I'll be honest with you, Bill. The CGI, in my opinion, as a moviegoer, it was, it was, it left a lot to be desired. If I'm being honest, I was very let down by the CGI. Felt very, it didn't feel real. I didn't feel like the character was in danger by what I was seeing. There's a million reasons why that could be, what, why it turned out the way it did. Don't want to point any fingers. It was just not my, it was not my personal cup of tea. That's I'll leave it at that. Okay. And it was always a, it was always like. The, this itching thing at the back of my mind because I love the film so much, but the some of the CGI took me out of the film. It just didn't work with, it just didn't work. And then I got the Blu-ray came out. I bought the Blu-ray and I was shocked to realize that there was a black and white version of the film. I love black and white films. I, I, starting going all the way back to Night of Living Dead. I just, I love the world that black and white creates. And what I discovered was that when I rewatched the movie in black and white, there's something about taking the color out of what I'm seeing, out of the, the CGI that suddenly made every CGI bit, whatever you want to call it, gag bit, all of a sudden everything worked. Everything clicked. It was perfect. And I realized that my problem was not the CGI per se, it was the color and the color made it look fake to me. The moment it was in black and white, suddenly it was like everything was terrifying, beyond terrifying, because it just, it sort of puts a malaise over the whole film and makes it seamless. And it's a real tribute to the, to, to, to Frank Darabont and his, his, you know, his decision to want to do a black and white version so much so that I started desaturating my TV when I watched horror movies because of the mist. I started doing it because I wanted to see if I would get the same feeling where it would sort of like take me out of like stuff that might not have worked. And it does when you put everything in black and white, 
Friday the 13th Part 6 is like a 1940s universal horror film, the way it's lit, if you remove all the color. It's crazy. I think that what that does is it makes the audience more of a participant in the film you, without having to see it because you're black and white. And that's something I strive for in all my films is I try to make the audience a participant. I don't want them to just sit back and just have everything spoon fed to them. I want them to be part of it. I, I was reading about the making of Rosemary's Baby and there's a scene where uh, you're peering, there's a, a door that's slightly open and you're peering into the next room and the producer went to Roman Polanski and said, well, wait a minute, why did you, why did you shoot this that way? And he says, when you see it with an audience, you'll know why. And uh, they had a screening with an audience. And during that scene, everyone in the audience went like this to try to see around the doorway. Oh. So he had made the audience participate in the story of the film. You know who else does that? You know, it's very interesting you say that. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Phantom of the Paradise by Brian De Palma. That's so Rick, Rick Baker's favorite movie. Is it really? Because it's one of my, so like right up there with Return of the Living Dead and a bunch of others is Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, and by the way, I saw the, I saw the restored version, the secret restored version that, yeah. that is, uh, I don't know if it's public yet, but it's, they took, they restored all the, uh, you know, it says death records over everything. It's supposed right. to say Swan records wow. and they were going to get in trouble with Led Zeppelin's. Zeppelin, uh, right. Swan song. Yeah. 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 So they had restored that somehow from that negative elements. I don't know. It was that, that was also at the Sleepy Hollow International Film Festival. And, um, but something that Brian De Palma is famous for, as you know, Bill, is he does the split screen. And right. it's the same thing. The audience is actually editing the movie by deciding which side to look at, right? Yeah. What's the most important thing to watch right now? Yeah. Right. And the audience, so it's like an un, it's such a crazy thing. It's an unedited scene being presented to the audience and going, okay, you cut the film with your eyes. I'm going to look over here for this many seconds. Now I'm going to look over here for this many seconds. And you make, and every time you watch Phantom of the Paradise or any Brian De Palma film where he does that carrier, yada, 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 you are cutting the film yourself as the audience. Yeah. Just really uh, brilliant stuff. Truly brilliant stuff. Um, I want to know this. What what led, how did you, how did you make the decision to, in the script, it, you know, the, 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 the way that the gas goes from the barrel, it goes up the chute, the whole, the whole, you know, thing that only the audience was supposed to see, what kind of challenge was presented to you as a production designer in trying to visually convey because what's funny is the characters never really find out they don't know what happens the audience is the only one who knows how what how did that process how did you come about that process and deciding i know it's i know that was written in but yeah. like yeah it was in the script and yeah. and i always start with the written word yeah and then try to okay how can i do this visually right now you and another thing too you also worked on invaders from mars with right. Toby Hooper yeah. uh, and James Karen. I try uh, to get Jimmy Karen on every film that I worked on because he's just the greatest guy to make movies with. Yeah. When we were on the set of Return of the Living Dead, he brought Jason Robards to the set, which I thought, how cool is that? Yeah. Jason Robards is visiting a zombie movie set. It's amazing. And plus, Jimmy would show up on the days he wasn't working to keep the other actors pumped up. Mm. And God, what a what a fantastic guy. So when I got hired for Invaders from Mars, I was looking for a role for, for Jimmy and I saw the general. And I thought, ooh, ooh. And so I suggested, I called Jimmy up and I called uh, and I talked with Toby Hooper, the director, and I said, uh, you should, you know, consider Jimmy Karen for the general. And Toby had worked with Jimmy on Poltergeist. Right. So he right. was aware of who he was in, in his work. And uh, so he, he got hired. I was delighted by that. And uh, when they were shooting, I, I came up to Jim. I said, you know, how's it going? He's just, and 
I vi was visiting the set during the shooting and I approached Jimmy and I said, you know, how, how did this work out for you? Is, is everything okay? Or is, and he says, Bill, it's phenomenal. He said, I was hired for two days. It's now going on two months. <laughs> I've put all my grandchildren through college. <laughs> this is the most financially successful film I've ever worked on. This is really great. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that's a great, that is a phenomenal example of a great remake, in my opinion, where a film, you know, you're, you're taken and that's, you know, you know, it's interesting too, how the 80s were such a great time for interesting horror and sci-fi remakes like The Fly and The Blob and Invasion from Mars. People don't talk about that. Invaders from Mars. People don't talk about that enough. The Thing. Uh, the uh, Donald Sutherland Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And bodies. Well, that was 78, but yes, totally a part of that. That totally, I would, I would, it's 78, but it's still, yeah, it's the same. What, what's, what, what's a couple of years? It's the same sort of thing. That, that Body Snatchers remake is truly phenomenal. And I'm just curious to know about uh, Invaders from Mars. What were what were the things that you were? Did you work? Did you design everything, or was it some like just like, the Martian stuff? The Martian stuff. Wow. All the Martian stuff. It was mine. So you made those two things, those two foot, those two hoofed, whatever they were, oh, the mouths. Well, well, the story of of that. You're talking about the drones, the Martian drones. Are, are they drones? The just the the big mouthed things on right. two. Yeah. yeah. So Rick Baker told me one of the things that always bothered him about guy in suit monsters is you can always tell it's a guy in a suit because of the configuration right. of the human body. And he said, what if we designed a suit that is worn backwards so that the legs, instead of going like this, go like that? And I thought, boy, that's cool. So when this film came around, I thought, this is my chance to do the, the Rick Baker backwards suit. And so I designed the, the Martian drone uh, so that the suit was worn backwards. Wow. Wow. I'm going to, you know, it's funny. I haven't seen that in years. I've been waiting. I've actually been waiting for a good Blu-ray release to buy it. I just want to own it. I have it on VHS. Um, that is, uh, I'm going to look for that next time I watch it. I've got an American and a UK Blu-ray version, and I supplied them with all the art that I did for the show. Oh, really? So it's a gigantic extra that's included. Who put that out? What? Where? Do you remember the company? Uh, might have been Shout Factory. I'm not sure. I don't know. Oh. Okay, I will check that out. I didn't know they put that out. You know, um, the funny thing is when they were doing the uh, DVD of Return of the Living Dead is they approached me and I said, you know, I've still got all the art from the film. Let's all put that in the extras. And they said, oh, no, God, that'll be too expensive. I, we, and we don't think people will be interested. And I talked them into using 10 pieces. Was that for the 2002 M MGM release? The first, yeah, first MGM DVD. Let me tell you something. I'll never forget going into Music Plus Movies in 2002 and going to my horror section and watch my jaw just dropped when I saw, oh my God, it's on DVD and there's bonus features and renting it on the spot. I, I called up MGM to, to tell them where to send the, the free copy. Yeah. And, uh, and they said, you know, God, we really wish we had put more extras in that. And I said, you know, I offered you all the art could have gone on to it. it said yeah it's our biggest selling dvd of the year really yeah it was a huge it was more successful as a dvd than it was as a film and let me tell you then the soundtrack came out i right around that time the soundtrack came out uh and i saw it in best buy and i was like this is the return of living dead soundtrack on compact disc in best buy like it was such a weird like an obscure 80s horror soundtrack that, you know, didn't have like, I don't know, it didn't, it wasn't as big as it is now. I feel like it's gotten so much bigger over the years. Um, oh, so that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, every time they have a screening in LA, it sells out in minutes. It, Cause it, I could only imagine, you know, I've never seen it on the big screen. I could only imagine how that plays with a live audience. It just must slay every time. Killer, it's killer. Truly, truly. 
Um, what was I going to ask you about? Not inv- oh, this is what I wanted to ask you. You talk about James Karen and how he was an incredible actor and yada, yada, yada. The other thing that's incredible about Return of Living Dead, and this is a testament to Dan a little bit too, I, I love the way that there are so many sort of master ensemble shots where they just let the actors act. Mm-hmm. A great example, when they're boarding up the tar man's door and it's just the six of them in a line doing their stuff. It doesn't cut in. It doesn't, it's just lets them, it, it's like a real, I feel like it's a real actor's scene, you know? And I feel like you, you really get a lot of that, especially with, with Freddie and Frank in the way and their interaction. And you really let the chemistry between the actors shine by not cutting, you know, back and forth so much. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like and these. Dan, Dan wasn't afraid to let them improvise as well. Yes. And you know, what's interesting, you know, a lot of people are like rubbed the wrong way by, you know, Dan with very, in various different things that I've read again, don't know, just read. But what's very interesting that I find very fascinating about Dan being a two time director is how open he was to suggestion and collaboration for someone who had to be so hands on. He was not afraid to take a suggestion and probably the best one, in my opinion, one of the best ones was when James Karen said, hey, what if I put myself in, I mean, what a ginormous deviation in writing. He's changing his whole character arc. And and Dan doesn't have uh, any ego about it. He goes, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, with the finishing touch, Jimmy putting his wedding ring. Oh, so good. And then, you know what that makes you think? Again, talking about like the details, what, what does that inform about the character that he's deeply religious in some way, shape or form? He gets down on his knees. He says, forgive me because suicide is a sin in the church or whatever. He puts his ring. He loves his wife. Honey, uh, 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 keep the pot roast in the oven. I'll be home, you know, in a little bit. You know, he's very close to his wife. And now he's never going to see his wife again. He's saying, forgive me. I don't want to be this thing. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to be like Freddie and you know, try to eat my, my significant other's brains. And yeah, um, Yeah, it expands the audience's experience outside of the screen. Oh, because you're, you're, you're thinking now about his life outside that story. Yep. Yep. And it just, it just really works. And you know what it's just, and then, you know, it's also works really well in the film. I love that you guys chose to not show Freddie at the end as much as i i used to always get mad about that i'd be like i want to see freddie banging on the door i want to see but what you've done is you've you've done the less is more jaws shark in the water approach you don't show us you just tell us with the voice tina i just broke my hand off but i still love you tina and that hearing it allows my brain to imagine it it's so much more than anything I could have been shown. And it really capt- it ends up again, once again, capturing the magic. You see him push through the door and he is by far, the tar man is terrifying, but Freddie is just as terrifying because he's not rotting, you know? He's not rotting. And, and uh, yeah, he's, he's not rotting, but he has a relationship with the other characters and with, with Tina. So that makes it even more personal for him when he s- switches and becomes this death machine. Right, right. And it's just, again, it just, it all works so well. And um, another thing to the, I know this is the two things. One, we're, we're wrapping up here. We're, we're winding down. We're going to land the airplane. Um, the that, That's my favorite thing to say where I'm like, I'm, we're wrapping it up, but we're not quite done just yet. Um, two things that really inform the, the set in your production design. One, the you need a medical sign so singularly this sign itself which i love so much i hope you'll forgive me that i had to trace a stencil of it i made my own t-shirt <laughs> and i have a t-shirt of unita that somewhere and you know when i quit smoking i started getting into making my own t-shirts and i reproduced my own unita t-shirt that because i was like no one's got this this is the coolest shirt ever with the design i printed it out off of google and i just did the trace the acetate and whatever um, 
that sign, which is the first thing you see after the, the you know, based on true events and the, the date and the time, uh, you see the sign and it really informs what kind of building it is. It's not just some warehouse. It really adds that it's a medical supply warehouse, you know, in addition to all the other stuff with the, the, the skeletons and the teeth, the, the, the teeth farm, which was, that was from Toby Hooper originally, that detail. What detail? Uh, the detail about the, t the, the farm, the, the, the bone. Oh, the oh, oh the India skeleton farm. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't know that to come from Toby. Well, I read in the book that Toby, that was a detail that was left over from to the one thing that Toby had done on the film before uh, Dan had taken over was the, was the teeth, the teeth farm or the, whatever the Indian farm in whatever with perfect teeth, that that actually came from Toby Hooper and not from Dan and Dan loved the detail so much, but I don't know. I don't know. That's what, um, so I thought the other thing that you did so brilliantly is the resurrection cemetery gate. Oh, thank you. The gate it, the gate informs what we're going to see inside. The gate in itself is its own character mm -hmm. that you created with just the way that it's aged in a place where there is no cemetery. Yeah. You know, it's kind of crazy. Um, what, a, what, how did you come about the car? You're like, this is a punker's car. He's going to spray paint it and write, you know, why and, you know, all this sort of stuff on it. Did you actually do that? Did the, did you let the actors do it? How did that come about? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I really don't. That's okay. That's okay. And, and again, guys, this is 38 years ago, 37 years ago. Whatever. I get the car mixed up with the car that's in uh, Masters of the Universe. That's another big, huge cruiser. Yes. Yes, indeedy. Yes, indeedy. Um, I'm just trying to think. I just want to, just while I have you here, I just want to make sure I'm not leaving anything out that, oh, here's something that's interesting. Uh, the, oh no, we talked about that already. Talked about that. Talked about that. Um, let me ask you this question. What, how did you, the, the yellow cadaver is a very ominous, probably the thing that feels closest to real death, like in real life, is the yellow cadaver. That's what connects you to the fantasy elements, because that feels so clinical and real. Was that a, was that a conscious choice on your part as a production designer to sort of make this feel really rooted in reality to then use as a bridge to go to the more fantastical elements of reanimated zombies. I, I'd like to say yes and take credit for that, but basically I was just following the screenplay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Bill, this has been absolutely uh, uh, beyond an honor and a treat and a treasure just to pick your brain and to you know, sit here and indulge me in letting me tell you all these things that my connections about the movie. And I just, I can't thank you enough for your work and what it's meant to me and countless people like me. And, you know, your, your work like is talked about all the time by horror fans. But Jeff, you forgot to ask the question. All right. This is super important guys. Sometimes when I get so wrapped up in, 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 my my guest and asking them questions i forget to ask the most important question of all the question for the excuse to talk to people who i really respect and appreciate and that is uh it's the thesis of this show and basically what i'm trying to figure out and i'm asking lots of different people about it and it's perfect because return of living dead is a punk rock film so we're going to ask bill stout production designer return of living dead Bill, is pizza punk? And if so, why? And if not, why? Okay, my answer is yes and no. Okay, yes, because it's it's something that's cheap, reliable, shareable, and so it's an inclusive group food. Uh, it's adaptable to choices. If some people don't like some of the toppings, they can put toppings on half the pizza and not on the other half. It's, uh, so it's non-judgmental as far as taste is concerned. And uh, I was heavily involved in the early punk scene in, in Los Angeles, punk music scene, because my girlfriend was involved 
to the scene. So I take her to shows, go to the underground clubs. I'd meet all the bands and those kids were all starving. So I'd take the band members home. I'd make them breakfast. And so I, I, I feel, I have a strong feeling for the punks. And I loved it, the fact that it didn't matter what you look like. You were accepted into that group if you liked that music. And I thought that was a great thing. And so for me, pizza is like that. So yes, it is punk. But on the other hand, no, because everybody, not just punks, loves pizza <laughs> all over the world. So it's not exclusive to punks. That was a phenomenal, I love that answer. It was phenomenal. And I really appreciate the the thought. And that's something we didn't even talk about. We didn't even get to the fact that there, that this, the, all the punk rock elements that are put into this film. It's such an iconic film within the, the, the punk, like punk pop culture as a whole. Yeah. Um, and we're and still the with the soundtrack, I believe. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. And it was so, I mean, again, we'll wind down here, but I, I, it, it's, it was, I feel like it's also a gateway film to people who may not know very much about punk or maybe what they do know about punk is what they've seen in Return of the Living Dead. So in a way, it almost bridges, it almost like bridges, uh, you know, or transcends in that kind of way. But I have to say, this has truly been such a pleasure and a treat for me uh, to have you on my show. And, uh, you know, I feel like I was extra, uh, uh, <laughs> I was, I was a little extra nerdy and geeky on this one, because again, I just, I, I am such a fan of your work and I just, I, I revere you and I appreciate everything that you've done for my imagination. And, uh, again, uh, you just, you're, you're, you, you and your stuff is inspiring and it will live forever. It is right. How about this, Bill? Your work is right alongside. It, it, it might not be right next to it. It's not neighbors with it, but it is down the hallway from King Kong. King Kong is here <laughs> and it's down. And what I mean by that is that the time difference, you know, that's the thirties. And then, but when you get up to the eighties, that's where the, that's where your stuff is, man. What a, what, I mean, what a cool thing, huh? Like truly, uh, yeah. and you don't need a a, a, a rinky dink podcast to tell you that you already know it, but you know, you should still say it. So. Well, it's a, it's a funny thing. That's of the 60 films I've done. That's the only film where I've still remained tight and close as friends to the cast. Hmm. And that's because Dan O'Bannon gave the cast this wonderful gift, two weeks of rehearsal prior to shooting. And the roles that weren't filled in yet that hadn't been cast, I was the guy who would read those lines. Yeah. And so we developed this tight little community within the film that carried over into real life. And so we, we, uh, we took two years and did a, a, a tour, me and the cast of all the monster and horror festivals and conventions around the country. And that bonded us even closer. And it's just, it's a wonderful thing. That is something you always see on social media, the cast of Return of Living Dead together. And it's true. There's no other cast of any film that you see that literally is still so close knit. And, you know, uh, those, you know, one of my biggest regrets is that I did not manage. It just was never, it was never the right time. It was never on my radar to get out to one of those things and meet a guy like, like James Karen, who was always there and always at, at those kind of things and just uh, bask in his presence for a few moments, you know, um, it's, but it's amazing that you guys were able to do that and whatnot. I got to really. tell you a funny James Karen story involved Please. with return. Uh, James Karen, Linnea Quigley, and I uh, were guests at Wonderfest in Louisville, Kentucky, as part of a celebration of Return of the Living Dead was one of the things that was being focused on. And uh, I was going upstairs to do a panel, and Frank Dietz, the moderator, took me aside. He said, Bill, we're going to play a little trick on Linnea. We're going to pretend, you and Jimmy are going to pretend that you actually shot the film here in Louisville because the film takes place in Louisville. Right, Kentucky. right. But we shot everything in Burbank or downtown LA. We, we never set foot in, in Kentucky to shoot the film. Although I have to say at, at many conventions, 
fans of that film will come up to me in Louisville and say, I know just where you shot that. That must be such a, what a, what a, that's, that's a compliment in and of itself that they think it's, I always thought that was a weird detail that the events take place in Louisville, Kentucky was such a weird. Yeah. So there was me, uh, Frank Dietz, the moderator, Linnea Quigley and Jimmy Karen uh, for the panel. And we start talking about the film and answering questions about the movie. And at one point, Jimmy Karen says, you know, to me, the greatest thing about making this movie was that was making it here in Louisville, Kentucky, where the people were just so friendly and so nice. And I look at Linnea and she's like, huh? <laughs> and, and then I joined in and I said, yeah, the, the folks here in Louisville, Kentucky, they made it so easy for us to make a wonderful film. They were just so gracious and so generous. And Linnea's got, still got this quizzical look on her face. And Jimmy Karen says, you know, the guy who impressed me the most was the mayor. The mayor <laughs> was just amazing. He had a wooden leg and, and inside that leg, it was filled with fine Kentucky bourbon. And if you wanted to drink, he would do a handstand and there was a little spigot on the leg where you could fill your glass with the bourbon. And I said, yeah, and man, that was the best bourbon. And Linnea said, you know, that was really fine bourbon. And the mayor was such a sweet man. Now we've got her convinced <laughs> that, that we actually made the film in Louisville, which was our goal. Did um now did James Karen just think that off the top of his head like just <laughs> just improv? Yeah, yeah. They don't make actors like that anymore, or like no. Clue, or like Clue. I mean, again, and and that's the interesting thing about what sells this material so well is that they play it so straight. Like you really aren't like you don't feel like you're it doesn't take any work to be brought into this world because of how serious all the actors take the material they really that, do that makes the comedy even funnier right right because what it's such a weird byproduct and i think there's no greater example than the pickaxe and the head scene but <laughs> there's this i mean it is the it's it, what's so funny is the byproduct is comedy as a result. And it just sort of blows mind. And you know, that scene also has an example of, I'm sure, again, Bill being a production designer, you know, the golden triangle of good, fast and cheap, right? You're familiar with that, uh, that uh, analogy of like, you can only have two out of the three, right? I it's think, two. yeah, right. I think Return of Living Dead has a scenario where it has all three good, fast and cheap. The butterflies on the display mm-hmm. Uh-huh. was good, fast, and cheap. Because you, you that's pin, true. right? You you cut them out in paper, you pin them yeah. to the thing, and then you just blow the fan on them and it looked like they're coming to life. So incredible. Incredible when you think about that. Um oh God. That's my favorite kind of stuff to do in films. The stuff that doesn't cost any money but is totally convincing to the viewer. Let me ask you this. Is that does that happen does that mainly only happen on set when you're on set, like where you're put into these situations where we need to make that work somehow, and then you can do something that's good, fast and cheap on the fly, or do those things also happen in pre-production where you can sort of come up with something like that? Oh, it's both. Interesting. It's it's both. There's nothing like stepping onto a, a, a real fully realized set and then looking at it and going, Oh, you know what? This could use this, or this could use Hmm. this. And you send a runner out to go get what's necessary, or if you have it, you know, in the art department, you just make it real fast and just put it on set. It's an organic process. Right. It's an organic process. Let me ask you this. I'm sorry. I know we're going to stop. I just had to ask you one, uh, just a couple more things. Sure. Um, the, uh, tell me about the, 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 the warehouse set, the, all the writing on the walls like besides Bert is a slave driver that sort of thing but I noticed the last time I watched it back to back last March mm-hmm. and I was just looking at and that's what I do I'll just like look at this particular thing and try to take notice of it all that stuff all those all those signs did you write those signs and stick them up there or did you yep. oh, wow yeah all handmade, handwritten. You know where that comes from? That comes from my working with Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder on Little Annie Fanny. 
and really? being a fan of the original Mad Comics that Kurtzman and Elder did. Okay. The detail work. So in the original Mad Comic books, you can read those Kurtzman stories. And you can read those Kurtzman stories, and they're they're funny on their own. But then Willie Elder adds all these little little gags within each panel that are just totally subsidiary. Uh, Kurtzman used to call those eyeball kicks. Eyeball kicks. Well, that's what that is. What's loaded in Return of Living Dead is eyeball exactly. kicks. Exactly. And that's where that comes from. It comes from my experience of working with Kurtzman and Elder on Little Annie Fanny for Playboy and huh. where we would include all those eyeball kicks within the stories. And what's funny, you really feel that in the basement set too. I mean, it feels like it's so, everything is so randomly strewn in that basement. It feels real. It just, it's so real to me. Like it doesn't look like it could ever be a set, you know? Yeah, it's it, carefully designed to look random. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, I, I've experienced this a little bit oh, down to like, you know, I've done a little bit of set dressing and I've done a little bit of production design in my own work in life. And the, the amount of, it's almost like the energy that it takes, like, let's say if there's just like a table and there's gotta be stuff on the table, but you can't just take a pack of gum and put it awkwardly on the table. It has to feel random. So what you find yourself doing is like, okay, there has to be ran This has to be a messy desk. But how do you make it messy? You just have to, you just have to like, it's almost like you have to live it, but you have to put, press yourself on fast forward. You can't spend the time to actually do it. You have to just sort of, <laughs> you, have yeah, to <laughs> you spend a few minutes creating an accumulation of years. Right, right, right. And that is like the, and that is something that you are a master of. Like it's oh, you, you, you're, ma but no, you are, man. Like a true and truly in just in, in, in all those in all those sets. Um, one other detail, I was curious to know whose idea was it to do the brilliant, this was a brilliant masterstroke. We need a helicopter. We need to show that the police are flying in over the cemetery. A helicopter is super expensive. What are we gonna do? Yeah. Hey, put a, put a dome on a crane with the camera and just like having, oh, we can't show the monster, we'll just show the monster's POV. Let's just show the, the, the helicopter's POV. How did that come about? Uh, that was O'Bannon's idea. Wow. And, no, that was, that was Dan O'Bannon's idea, and that was Dan O'Bannon's voice. He, he did the voiceover for that particular scene. Right. Everybody thinks he's uh, the police a, captain. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there was another scene, too, uh, where we were supposed to, let's see, uh, Clue Gulliger was supposed to climb up a ladder, look out the window, and see whether or not the lights at the crematorium were on. And I had designed a, a little miniature set of the crematorium, and that, that was what he was going to look at. But uh, the budget didn't allow for the creation of that. And so, <laughs> so Clue just looks, he says, ah, yeah, the lights are on. <laughs> Boom, sells it. Uh, talk about good, fast, again, good, fast, and cheap. It's just like, it's amazing how, and, and again, it's the inverse. So it's a very interesting thing about filmmaking where really in elevated filmmaking, you don't tell, you show. You always want to show, you don't tell. But then sometimes you got to, you can't show, so you have to tell. The inverse yeah. is necessary. And that is a prime example of we can't show, we have to tell, but it's perfectly convincing. It doesn't feel ex expositionarily, uh, what's the word? Expo, expositionary? It doesn't feel yeah. loaded with exposition. Overly expositioned, yeah. Overly expositioned is what I mean to say. And All right. it helps to have an actor like Clue deliver that line because he, he totally sells it. Precisely. You, you believe him. And it's amazing that he, it's amazing how he came late in the game. He was the last person to join the cast. The cast had all practiced together, had rehearsed together. He came in and he just, he shoes right in. Like you don't, it doesn't, he doesn't feel like an odd duck out in any scene at all. It just, again, uh, it's just and, that. And it feels like the hapless boss too. Yes, totally. He totally does. All right, final question, because if I don't stop, if I don't stop, I'm never going to stop asking you questions. Final question. The decision, did Dan ever talk with you about the decision as to why he wanted to do, and you know what's going to happen? We're going to end this, and a thousand things are going to come to my mind. That I'm going to say, duck, why didn't I ask him? I'll email you. 
Um, so we'll do part, we'll do part two. Uh, well, well, if there's listen, if I accumulate enough for part two, you better don't 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 uh, 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 don't don't make a promise that you can't keep there, pal, because I will I will call you up. Um, the, the decision to do uh, the the true life, the true events at the beginning and then the the, um, you know, the time and the date and the place. Why? What does that, what was the reasoning behind that? If from, if Dan ever told you. Oh, that was Dan's way of locking the audience in to uh, a time place situation. But at the same time, it's funny. Yeah. Cause you know, you're going to see a zombie movie. Right. And, and that de- that level of detail that it's real is absurd on, on the face of it. But it's excellent. Same, same time, it sort of sets your head like, okay, we're going to watch this real thing. It's so it's so incredibly excellent, and it just it just up. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say. It's this, yeah. Dan, Return of the Living Dead is a movie and a script and a story where every scene it's a masterstroke in writing. Every scene informs the next scene. Every single thing that comes after the thing before it is a direct reaction to what has just happened. It's not a film that's just filling time or filling space or a character study. Not Nothing's wrong with those films either. But this is a film where everything, there's an urgency that is driven by every previous scene into the next scene. And Dan gets himself into this place where he's like, where do I take the film? Where is this supposed to go? I know, let's just drop a bomb on everything. <laughs> and it works. Yeah, it works. It's like we, he's written his characters into a basement. Where's the movie supposed to go? The dead are taking over everything. How do you how do you uh, stop? What are we going to do? Well, of course, the government, the evil government is going to drop a bomb on, <laughs> on everybody. It's yeah. just so brilliant, man. It's just so friggin brilliant. It's like if you want to write a screenplay, just watch Return of the Living Dead. Truly. Dan is so brilliant at structure. He he wrote a book on screenplay writing. I have it. Yeah. I have it. I read it. Uh, It's a great book. Really, truly. He knows his stuff. He really, really knew his stuff. I mean, he did Alien too, so, you know. And Blue Thunder. Yes, and Blue Thunder. Yes, yes. Yes, and you know what? I also, because I wanted to be a completionist, I had to own The Resurrected, which is Dan's one other movie. And, you know, I know Dan was like, had was really had a bad taste in his mouth from directing after that film. But I got to tell you, it is not, you know, it is a really great film. I feel like it's a very misunderstood film uh, in in what it is, you know? Oh, I agree. Yeah. I, I think uh, people underestimate that movie. It's it's phenomenal. It really is. And it's my the big, the greatest crime in the world is that there are just not more Dan O'Bannon films out there in the yeah. world. That That's mostly due to ill health. I'm I know. Sure. I know. I'm, I'm aware. But it's still, you know, I don't know. I think of all the... Well, we got what we got. We got what we got. We got what we got. And um, at least, in the very least, um, I'm sure that there is a stack of unproduced Dan O'Bannon screenplays. Maybe somehow, some way, one of them will find its way into production somewhere in the future. Who knows? You know what I mean? Well, that's my big frustration. Uh, at one of the screenings we did, of Return of the Living Dead, I think it was in the theater that Quentin Tarantino owns here in LA. Hmm. Uh, Dan and I were talking and Dan said, Bill, I've got all these projects I wanna do with you. I wanna do, I want to a game with you. I wanna do comic books with you. I've got more movies I want you to design. And then, you know, within the next few months he passed away. Hmm. It's a so, shame, man. It's true. So, so curious as to what that stuff was because I know it was gonna be wonderful. I don't know if you ever saw uh, The Long Tomorrow, which is a comic book story he did with Mobius. Uh, is that? It's the oh. design template for Blade Runner. Okay, right, because, okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute, yes, I remember reading about that, or maybe you were the one who told me that in this book. Did you talk no, about that in this book? Maybe. Yeah, at the it's, end. It's a great story by Dan, that's Blade Runner. Right, right. Yes. Now I remember we, I read that. I, so um, somewhere on my YouTube channel, I read what you wrote in the back of this book and you spoke about that. And I didn't realize that Dan had informed Blade Runner in that way, shape and form. That to me, that, yes, that did, that did truly did blow my mind. And I really, truly hope, I hope that if 
the um, the curmudgeon who has the rights to Return of Living Dead does somehow you know decide that the gears do get working on uh, get turning, mm-hmm. I, especially after what we got. I won't even bring it up. The, just the 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 travesty that that occurred, the aftermath. I will say, let's just call it the aftermath. I hope that they do bring you in somehow because it's just not no, nobody's going to do it justice like you will do it justice in okay. whatever role, whether it's you know production design or frankly even as the director. Because I could totally imagine who better to direct a, a, a Return of Living Dead movie where you're going to really get the flavor from the original film than the guy who did the production design. And it's just like, it's just like, I hope that, I hope that that stuff gets worked out somehow. And I hope they call you up. They should. It's just, if they want to do this stuff justice, because you, you are one of the ingredients that is the secret sauce of that film. It needs to happen. Well, thanks. Well, I hope if that happens, they hire you as my producer. (laughs) I listen, I am a producer, but not in that I, I would just in that sense, I just want to be a fan in the movies. I feel like I'm sure I would pull my hair out with the stress. Could you imagine being a fan of Return of the Living Dead and the stress of wanting to do the best possible job you could? And just oh, yeah. I, I would I would die. Well, uh, before he had made it, Rick Baker told me that Peter Jackson was doing a remake of King Kong. And he yeah. said, there's a fight with a Kong and a pack of Tyrannosaurus. And I'm like, let me at it. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah. but it just didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting again, we'll end on this. We'll really end on this. Cause I got to go too. I'm sure you got to go. You've been so generous with your time. Um, what's interesting though, about that is they were going to do King Kong that they didn't have the technology that they needed to do what they did in 2005. They, they didn't have it yet. And what's funny is, he ended up doing the Frighteners next. Uh-huh. And the Frighteners is what allowed them to develop the computer technology at Weta, which uh-huh. then allowed them to eventually do all the, the future tech, you know, that they would do in Lord of the Rings and eventually in King Kong. It mm-hmm. all started, but had they done King Kong at that time, I, I am a huge, I love that remake again, but I, the, 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 the original film to bookend our conversation, we started with King Kong, we'll end with King Kong. It's not, um, the original is not a sacred cow for me in the same way that if they did make remake return of living dead, I would probably, and it wasn't, it didn't have everybody involved that needed to be involved. And I might go, Oh no, 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 no. The original only, you know, I don't feel that I don't have that, that deep sacred connection to the original King Kong. So I actually really enjoyed the the remake of King Kong. And I just think that they, I don't know that Peter Jackson would have been able to accomplish anything that he accomplished in it had he not, had he tried to do it in 1996 when they originally were going to have him do King Kong. It's yeah. a good thing that he didn't do it then. So yeah. it would have been, you would have hated it even more than you did in 2005. How about that? I like <laughs> I like the attempted uh, recreation of the spider pit sequence. Have you seen that? Uh, oh, he, uh, didn't he do? Wasn't he involved with that? He, he produced it. He produced and directed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the uh, a fake missing spider pit sequence. Right. The only right. problem I have with it is that he cast instead of casting guys that look like rough and tough sailors like the original thirty three film had, I, I think he cast animators. Who who would never pass as sailors at all? But Wait, but I can on. see why he did that. They probably they just did it for fun. It wasn't going to ever be inserted in the film. Just to clarify, are you you're talking about you're not talking about the 2005. You're talking about a special bonus feature for the original King Kong, correct? Yes. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we were talking about the same thing. Yeah. Because Peter Jackson is the biggest con collector in the world. Right. And, he, and he's got like the original armature to the yes. you know, Styracosaur. So he, he got to use all that stuff. Right. So that is, that man, what a trip. I don't know if you've seen his documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old. The stuff that he is doing, he is, he, he really is doing some incredible stuff with film technology that, you know, and restoration that uh, the likes of which has never been seen before. And you should definitely check it out. They shall not grow old. It was a World War One film that he. Yeah, uh, he's he's the guy. I mean, I I am not a fan of the books Lord of the Rings, but 
he made what to me those unreadable books into incredibly yeah. viewable and watchable motion pictures. I think those three, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is just fantastic. I feel the, yeah. you know, with Bill, I feel the same way. I've never been, the books have never been, a, once again, never been a sacred cow to me. Love mm -hmm. the movies. I think the movies are great. And what he just did was he went back and he tried to make the the Hobbit movies, which are uh, Hobbit movies, were not as good as the Lord of the Rings films. He tried to sort of make them, give them all the same veneer so they all feel like they were made at the same time, which I'm really happy about. So I'm gonna, <laughs> excited to check that out. Bill, I'm gonna let you go, because if I don't, I'm never gonna stop talking to you. I, I just wanna say again, thank you so much. You are an incredible fellow, and I have so much respect for you and your work and your time. Thank you. If I do think of more things to, to ask you about, you, you better be careful because I'm going to knock on your email and go, Bill. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, when it's a sizable list, give me a call. Okay, I will. And if I ever cross paths with you at a convention, you better believe I'm going to buy you a slice of pizza. Oh, it sounds great to me. <laughs> okay, good. All right. As we always say on Pizza Punk, peace and hair grease. Yeah. <laughs>